Hello, and welcome to this webinar on the 2024 update to the clinical practice guideline on the pharmacologic glycemic management of type 2 diabetes in adults. I'm Beiju Shah, and I'm an endocrinologist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre and a professor at the University of Toronto. I had the privilege of being the lead author for the guideline, which was published in the October 2024 issue of the Canadian Journal of Diabetes. I'm presenting this on behalf of the entire writing team who are shown here. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that we had a diverse group of authors covering a range of different clinical areas and from uh, representation from many parts of the country. We made a deliberate effort to ensure that our authors had minimal, if any, conflicts of interest with the pharma pharmaceutical industry. And we also this year added two family physicians to the clinical practice guideline authorship group because we recognize that primary care is one of the main audiences for the guidelines. And it was important to have their perspectives incorporated into the guideline as we wrote them. So I'm going to now move into an introduction to the update and the principles that we used as we were developing the new guideline. So one of the key things that we really wanted to focus on was that we wanted the guidelines to provide guidance to support patient management. We intentionally only provided a very brief synopsis of the literature and justification for the recommendations, but we deliberately did not go into a lot of detail about specific trials. And I made a conscious effort to not include any hazard ratios or p-values anywhere in the guideline. We felt that if people wanted to get more detail, there are other publications like systematic reviews or meta-analyses that can provide that kind of data. But the focus on the guidelines was really to guide clinical care, and we wanted to have very clear and easy to follow algorithms and, and figures. To aid this, we, have, we engaged a graphics designer to ensure that the, the visuals were also clear cut. The literature review for this guideline covered the published evidence for pharmacologic glycemic therapy of type 2 diabetes in adults that was published between June 2020, which was the end of the last update's literature review, and February 2023. We used the evidence that was accumulated from the systematic review to adapt previous recommendations and create new ones where appropriate. In addition, we also added a review of the evidence regarding adverse effects of glucose lowering agents, which has been added to the guideline. So this slide shows the key changes from the 2020 update to the guidelines to the 2024 update to the guidelines. The first is that the recommendations for specific agents with cardiorenal protective agents, but with cardiorenal, uh, the first, the first is that recommendations for specific agents with cardiorenal protective benefits are now framed around patient characteristics instead of patient outcomes as they were in 2020. And the rationale for this is that we felt that clinicians don't ask when they're seeing a patient, what should I use if I want to prevent a hospitalization for heart failure in this person? Instead, they ask, what should I be using for this patient in front of me who has chronic kidney disease? And so therefore we felt that a more patient oriented approach to the guideline made more sense than an outcome oriented approach. Another important change is that the recommendation for heart failure applies now for both preserved and reduced ejection fraction. And that represents the evolution of the evidence since 2020. And finally, we changed the recommendation for patients at high cardiovascular risk. And I'll be talking about this in more detail later in this session. This is the main figure from the guideline that shows the main algorithm for the management of type two diabetes in adults and the recommendations for different patients about what agent to use. This is really some, uh, a, a sort of a pictorial version of what the individual recommendations go through. And I'll be going through the recommendations later on in detail. Another important figure that we added in this guideline is the dosing guidelines for patients with chronic kidney disease. And this is an adaptation of a previously published uh, uh, clinical a recommendation for patients with CKD. And we see the different agents across the top and different degrees of renal insufficiency down the side. And the figure shows what are the recommended maximum doses um, for the different agents with different degrees of renal failure. 
So now I'm going to move into the individual recommendations, and we can talk about some of them in more detail as we move through. So recommendation number one in the guideline is that physical activity, nutrition therapy, self-management education and support, and weight management are important components of glycemic management for type 2 diabetes, both at the onset and throughout the course of disease, and should be incorporated into every person's individualized care plan. We did not get into any further details about these kinds of issues in this guideline because there are already other guidelines uh, focusing on these topics as well as other related topics like glycemic control targets, glucose self-monitoring and diabetes remission. And really our focus was really only on pharmacologic glycemic management. So recommendation number two was that once the decision to initiate pharmacotherapy is made, Metformin is recommended as the initial antihypoglycemic medication because of its durable efficacy, neg negligible effects on hypoglycemia and weight gain, relatively mild side effect profile, long-term track record, and affordability. And the initial dose should be low to minimize the risk of gastrointestinal side effects with gradual increases in the maximum dose. Now, we recognize that this recommendation does differ from some other clinical practice guidelines that have been published from other organizations around the world recently, but we really had to be true to our evidence-based um, metrics and methods used at Diabetes Canada. And really, we recognize that although the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study is an old trial, it remains the only trial that evaluated first-line therapy in people with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. And so for this specific question about initiation of pharmacotherapy in a newly diagnosed patient, it really is the best and only evidence that we have. Some of the cardiovascular outcome trials using some of the newer agents did have some patients with newly diagnosed diabetes, but the vast majority of them had much longer diabetes um, with median durations ranging anywhere from nine up to 15 years in those trials. And nearly all of the patients in those trials were already on glucosaurine agents. So therefore those data really are not answering the question that we have about initial pharmacotherapy. Recommendation number three is that insulin with or without metformin is recommended as initial therapy for individuals who have metabolic decompensation and or severe symptomatic hyperglycemia. Once an individual is metabolically stable, it may be possible to taper or discontinue the insulin and replace it with other agents as required. And this is similar to the previous recommendation. Furthermore, in recommendation number four, we say that even in the absence of metabolic decompensation, Combination therapy is recommended as initial pharmacologic therapy for people with marked hyperglycemia, and that the choice of the second agent to start alongside metformin should be based on the individual's priorities, preferences, and comorbidities. Finally, the last recommendation pertaining to initial therapy in people with newly diagnosed diabetes. For individuals with cardiovascular or renal comorbidities at the time of diabetes diagnosis, specific GLP-1 receptor agonists and or SGLT2 inhibitors should also be used as initial pharmacotherapy for cardiorenal protection, as we will discuss in more detail in recommendation 10. But it's important to say that they should be used in addition to metformin. Recommendation number six states that dose adjustments, substitutions, and or addition of other antihyperglycemic medications should be made in order to reach target A1C within three to six months. Recommendation seven, also unchanged from previously, says that cardiovascular and renal status should be reviewed at least annually to determine if treatment intensification or modification is required. Now, when we move into uh, treatment intensification, recommendation eight states that before intensifying pharmacologic therapy, it is important to assess for potential precipitants of increasing A1C, such as infection, ischemia, concomitant medications, or changes in eating or physical activity. It's also important to explore medication adherence and barriers to adherence, such as adverse drug effects, costs, beliefs, and preferences. So this recommendation is really to take a patient-centered approach when facing a patient who uh, may require intensification of pharmacologic therapy, just to ensure that there aren't other reasons uh, or other explanations for the increased A1C that should also be addressed. Recommendation number nine 
says that for individuals who do not have cardiovascular or renal comorbidities, the choice of an antihyperglycemic medication when treatment intensification is required should be based on the individual's priorities, preferences, and comorbidities. Those priorities may include things like weight loss, avoidance of hypoglycemia, the desired magnitude of glucose lowering, cost, side effects, the possibility of pregnancy, and other comorbidities. In other words, this recommendation is saying that for patients who do not have a specific indication for a specific medication, the choice of agent to use when intensifying therapy should be patient-centered and focused around the priorities of that specific patient. Now we move to recommendation number 10, which states that priority should be given to medications with specific cardiorenal benefits for certain subgroups of individuals, regardless of their A1C level. So remember, that's a really key point that for patients uh, who have indications for these agents, they should be on these agents regardless of what their A1C is at the beginning. And that is including in patients who are newly diagnosed with diabetes. So a GLP-1 receptor agonist and or an SGLT2 inhibitor with demonstrated evidence of benefit is recommended for individuals at high cardiovascular risk. And the specific agents that have a demonstrated evidence of benefit are shown in the brackets there and are also discussed in the text of the guideline. Now, what does this mean at high cardiovascular risk? So let's talk about that in a little more detail. So in the 2020 guidelines, there were separate recommendations for people with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, in other words, secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, and for people who didn't have any established cardiovascular disease, but who were aged at least 60 and had two or more other cardiovascular risk factors, in other words, a primary prevention group. Now, as it happened, both of those recommendations in the 2020 guidelines suggested GLP-1 receptor agonists and or SGLT2 inhibitors should be used, but it was two separate recommendations. The challenge that we had when we were revising these guidelines is that in fact, none of the clinical trials were sufficiently powered or designed to separately examine people with secondary prevention, prevention versus primary prevention. Every trial included a secondary prevention group, but only some of the trials included a primary prevention group. And the definition of the primary prevention group and who got into the trial was quite variable. They all included age as a risk factor, but some had age of 60, some had age of 50. Uh, they all required additional cardiovascular risk factors, but sometimes it was one additional factor, sometimes it was two. And then this menu of risk factors that could be chosen or to, that, and the menu of risk factors that could be present to make a patient eligible for that trial was variable. Hypertension, tobacco use, and dyslipidemia were common risk factors, although even then there were slight nuances in how they were defined. But other risk factors were included in some trials and not others, things like left ventricular dysfunction or microalbuminuria or long diabetes duration. So in the end, the proportion of patients with primary prevention, in other words, those without established cardiovascular disease, ranged from anywhere from zero up to 70% of the patients in the cardiovascular outcome trials, with the vast majority of them being in the sort of 20 to 30% range. So a key challenge, therefore, in interpreting the evidence is that the trials were underpowered to examine whether the primary prevention subgroup received the same benefits as the secondary prevention subgroup. To be true to the evidence, therefore, we removed the recommendation for age greater than 60 and greater than two greater than or equal to two cardiovascular risk factors, because that was the inclusion criteria for only one of the outcomes trials. And instead, we used the terminology that was what was used in all of the trials, that it was for people at high cardiovascular risk. And we can say from reviewing the meta-analyses, we can conclude that the benefits of GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors is clear in those with established cardiovascular disease. In other words, those at the very highest of the high cardiovascular risk group. However, for people who have multiple cardiovascular risk factors in the absence of cardiovascular disease, so that primary prevention group who are not as high risk, the benefits are less certain. And it has to be more of a shared decision-making um, decision between the practitioner and the patient as to whether or not those uh, benefits might be accrued for using these specific agents or whether other agents might be more appropriate for that particular patient. 
So the rest of recommendation 10 looks at other situations other than high cardiovascular risk. So we do recommend an SGLT2 inhibitor with demonstrated evidence of benefit for individuals with heart failure with either eject, reduced or preserved ejection fraction. And an SGLT2 inhibitor is also recommended for, uh, for those individuals with chronic kidney disease. And in both cases, the specific agents that have demonstrated evidence of benefit are shown in the brackets and are discussed in the text of the guideline. Note that the FLOW trial in patients with chronic kidney disease examining a specific GLP-1 receptor analog was published after our evidence review was completed, so we did not make a recommendation about its use in this guideline. However, there will be a forthcoming update to the chronic kidney disease guideline, and that will address this trial. Now, moving on to the use of insulin in type 2 diabetes. So great, recommendation 11 says that all individuals starting insulin should receive education on the prevention and management of hypoglycemia, as before. Recommendation 12 says that a single daily injection of a basal insulin is recommended as the initial insulin regimen when adding to current antihyperglycemic therapy with doses titrated to reach the fasting glucose target. We do say that long-acting insulin analogs should be considered over NPH to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia and that Degludec or Glargine U300 may be considered over other long-acting insulin analogs to reduce the risk of nocturnal hypoglycemia. In recommendation 13, we also add that an incretin and or an SGLT2 inhibitor should be continued or initiated when introduce, introducing basal insulin. And then finally, for patients whom, uh, who move, need to move on to bolus insulin, recommendation 14 says, if bolus insulin is required, it should be initiated using a stepwise approach, starting with one injection with the largest meal, and then introducing additional mealtime injections later as needed. Dosing should be titrated to reach postprandial glucose targets. And that is again, very similar to the previous 2020 guideline. Rapid acting insulin analogs may be considered over short acting regular insulin to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia and insulin secreted gogs should be discontinued to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia in this situation. Thank you very much. And we hope that the new guideline is useful in your clinical practice.